The Tom Woods Show, episode 946. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Men, get yourselves an affordable and top-notch shave using Harry's razors. Just cover three smackers for shipping, and you can claim your free trial offer from Harry's today. That's a $13 value for free when you sign up at harrys.com slash woods. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Lou Rockwell is finally back on the show. I am delighted to announce. And I thought we'd just talk about current events, what's going on with CNN, with the president in Poland and Russia, possibly North Korea, a whole bunch of fun stuff, and also Murray Rothbard thrown in. Lou, as most of you know, publishes LouRockwell.com, which is the indispensable libertarian website. He's the founder and chairman of the Mises Institute over at Mises.org. He was a um, chief of staff to Ron Paul and a tremendous benefactor of mine. Uh, He really, over the years, I really can't think of anybody who boosted me and my work more consistently than Lou, even at particularly dark moments. Uh, Lou was there as a friend, boosting and helping me to get the word out, and uh, you know that alone makes him a great guy, but good thing for him, he's got 873 other things that make him a great guy. So I'm always glad to have a chance to talk to him. Lou, welcome back to the show. Tom, great to be with you. A lot of stuff going on. I am interested in this whole unfolding CNN fiasco. So for (laughs) anybody who somehow hasn't been paying attention or something or had the good fortune to go on vacation, what happened is that the president tweeted out a video, which was drawn originally from a wrestling event from years ago, but somebody patched on the CNN logo onto the head of Trump's opponent. And you see Trump outside the ring of this event, who and he actually body slams the guy, but now the guy has a CNN head. And everybody, well, by everybody, I mean just people in the media, were up in arms because this is supposedly encouraging violence against the media. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and of course, don't you all remember growing up and knowing that professional wrestling was fake? Right, just like their news. Right? Why are they so worked up about this? What did you think about that whole thing? And then CNN's response. Well, first of all, of course, I loved it, and I I, uh, I thought it was a lot of fun, and I remember having it was seen, funny having seen that before, and it was of course a setup. Uh, nobody was actually body slammed. That was the head of the WWE uh, that Trump was having a phony feud with, as this happens in professional wrestling, and uh, so it just. Just funny, and it was, I thought, especially funny that some, apparently a kid, sent this out on Reddit with the CNN logo instead of the guy's head, uh, and then Trump retweets it, or tweets it, uh, maybe not as a retweet, but he put it he put it out on his Twitter feed. And yeah, CNN absolutely flipped out, claiming that Trump was uh, calling for violence against them, although he, at most, he could be, I guess, charged with calling for phony violence against them, as you say, like they're fake news. But they they flipped out, and of course, these are the people who think it's charming and wonderful that that in a modern dress version of Julius Caesar, uh, they've dramatically extended the uh, assassination scene, and Trump and the uh, guy playing Caesar looks exactly like Trump, dresses like Trump, talks like Trump, and and uh, I'm not for shutting that down. They they have the right to do what they want, but I I'm, I'm aware that. If uh, this had happened under the Obama administration with Obama as playing Caesar, CNN would have been the first to call for everybody being arrested and jailed. So um, I don't want to shock anybody. They turned out to be hypocrites, but very thin-skinned hypocrites. And I think for good reason, because who believes them, who trusts them, who likes them? You have, the, you have their very strong fans who are uh, among the left, uh, but regular Americans, as well as, of course, right-wing Americans— despise CNN, but never look at it. So that's my own position. And, and uh, uh, they're aware of it. So they're aware that they're in a precarious position, uh, but they just have to keep going. They have to keep making more openings for Trump and uh, all the critics of CNN and, the, and of course, MSNBC and uh, even Fox is not too hot and uh, all the broadcast networks are terrible. Really, Tom, I've never seen anything like this in my life. This is this is a more intense attack 
on a public uh, figure than uh, even, I think, Joe McCarthy. I mean, it's quite – it's really quite astounding, but it's not working. I mean, because whenever Trump does something that bugs his base, which is uh, uh, unfortunately all too often, it only takes something like this – and I'm sure Trump knows exactly what he's doing – to bring the base back to him uh, because they can't stand CNN. I, I feel the same way. They hate CNN and everything CNN stands for. So um, – it's tremendous fun. We don't get much for our tax dollars, but the Trump tweeting is one of the things we do get. So it's fun. It's entertaining. And uh, it bugs all the right people. I, I, uh, I enjoy it. And I, I, th- I think plenty of other people do, too. Um, I was just going to say one thing about professional wrestling. Uh, I, I'd gone to matches as a kid uh, in the last couple of years because of the wonderful libertarian wrestler Kane. I was able to uh, see some matches in uh, Columbus, Georgia. And I was amazed and thrilled to see who the audience was. It was virtually all dads and little boys, maybe the friends of their sons, multiple sons or whatever. And uh, they all loved it. And uh, uh, of course, everybody knows this is make-believe violence, not actual violence. And I thought, it, you know, sort of uh, it uh, thrills little boys and uh, in a way that's entirely harmless it's quite a, it's, you know, it's quite a, I had a new appreciation for it. Uh, it's quite a wonderful thing. So no wonder CNN doesn't get it. Uh, they, they don't get anything that's in the mainstream culture or the, uh, certainly the culture of the deplorables. They're entirely separate. And uh, I think and hope they're going down. I, I think that they're uh, going to be in even more financial and other, other trouble than they, than they are now. And there's a great rumor that AT&T, which may be buying Time Warner uh, and therefore would have control of CNN, is concerned they want to they want to revise CNN. They want to revamp it. They don't like the way CNN is operating. So I hope that's true. And certainly they're worrying about that at CNN. Uh, and they should worry. I love to have them worry. Well, let's say a word about James O'Keefe and Project Veritas. Now, once this all dies down, I'm going to try and get him on. I discovered the other day that we're Facebook friends. I don't recall this, but I've been on Facebook for, I guess, at least 10 years, so that's possible that could have happened. But anyway, he's been releasing videos pretty regularly, day after day, and they're undercover video, or they're videos that are uh, recorded without the knowledge, obviously, of the people at CNN. And the one just yesterday, I mean, the first couple ones were, uh, you know, the Russia story is BS and a nothing burger and all that. And then the other day, he got somebody saying, a bunch of things, including that none of us can stand Chris Cuomo, but he (laughs) happens to be the the governor's brother and we're not. And you just, and and he's so dumb every time he opens his mouth, we're all saying, just shut up. So (laughs) stuff like that is also glorious to see. Uh, And and I'm reading, you know, we, you and I both read uh, Bob Wenzel and he absolutely insists that O'Keefe has so much more to come. And I wish I knew what that meant, but uh, comment about Project Veritas. What an astounding thing that uh, O'Keefe has done. Um, I think we all owe him uh, a tremendous debt of gratitude for his showing up of Planned Parenthood uh, and showing just what monster these these people are. I mean, they're really ghouls. They're vampires. They're, they're of course, uh, communists and everything else evil. And he showed them up. The media, of course, kept saying, don't believe what these people are saying. It's all phony. Um, o- O'Keefe is a trickster. They're not actually saying these things. So it's uh, um, it really, if you want to know about the abortion industry in this country, O'Keefe exposed it as it never has been exposed before. And now look what he's doing to CNN. He did the same thing to various left-wing groups that were uh, on Obama's side uh, in, in previous elections, uh, showing that they were glad to enlist anybody as a voter, even if they knew that they were illegals. I don't think there's any question there was vast amount of, of uh, bringing illegals into voting booths by the Democratic Party and, and uh, George Soros' um, various foundations and, and uh, nonprofits. And so Keith, and, and now he's done this, it really is astounding to see these people speaking the truth. I mean, it's a tremendous, uh, just a tremendous thing. And uh, I know sometimes people imply this is illegal for him to do it. It's not illegal. 
Uh, Georgia, where this was taking place, is one of those states where only one person has to know that you're being recorded. And of course, by the way, the government claims they can record you even though, you know, <laughs> they can record two people talking even if neither one of them agrees. Um, but anyway, in Georgia, you can record. And he's just, uh, O'Keefe is a star. He's, he's uh, just extra- an extraordinary guy. I mean, a great entrepreneur. And uh, he's another Tom Woods, maybe. Uh, so this is, huh. this is, this is uh, just thrilling. Yeah, it, it is. And, and on that matter of Planned Parenthood and abortion, you know, people tried to come back with, oh, it's not what it looks like and all that. But <laughs> I, I distinctly recall there was one video where they've got these aborted baby sitting there on a table and one of them and one of the women in the room I mean normal people don't act like this Uh, one of the women in the room pointed at one and said oh this was a boy and they go oh but but not like oh isn't it a shame this is a dead boy in front of me like they're clearly they're not saying oh here here's an unidentifiable clump of tissue they they weren't saying that they were saying oh here and it was just ghoulish ghoulish is the word I, i think i even used that word at the time now the funny thing about all this lou is that given their insane opposition to trump and believe me there are a lot of things you know, I didn't like the Syria bombing. There are plenty of things to say against Trump. But given that you could have said almost all those things, apart from apart from his buffoonery, you could have said all those things about any president and then some. So I'm not buying that that's the real reason they're upset at him. What's interesting about all this is that really when you look at his foreign policy, and as you told me before we went on, when you look at what he's saying in Poland, and maybe you could tell us what he's saying in Poland, he really is just doubling down on the bipartisan foreign policy. So these people are paranoid. They're crazy paranoid. He's not really giving you, uh, you know, a Pat Buchanan foreign policy. So what are they all so hysterical about? Well, I think what they what they fear, what they are hysterical about, is the people who support Trump. The idea that that many Americans despite all the attempts to prevent this from happening, voted for somebody who they thought was happy to overthrow the entire system, who wanted, at least if you could believe him during the campaign, a foreign policy of peace, who wanted to be friends with other countries uh, and wanted a, a sea change and didn't like the deep state and didn't like the whole apparatus in Washington, didn't like the Republicans any more than he liked the Democrats, and wanted the fact, I think it terrifies them to every moment of their lives now, that that many Americans agree with the Trump they saw during the campaign. That is why they're, that's, that's why they flip out. So, uh, it somehow, it, so it doesn't matter if Trump's doing stuff they like, if it were anybody else uh, besides Trump doing it, they can't stand the thought of, is this the beginning of a revolution? Is this, is this not the end of these sorts of ideas? But regardless of what Trump does or doesn't do, is this the beginning of a very significant uh, change in American foreign policy? And maybe uh, uh, other policies of government, maybe in the entire uh, Western world's foreign policies, could be. So we can hope and pray that's the case. But they're terrified of it. And that's, again, why they flip out while they're constantly on a hair trigger alert. Uh, and of course, these shows, I myself have a very hard time watching, say, Morning Germ, as I think of that show. Um, but every show, so far as I can tell, is nothing about, it's a hate Trump. Uh, and, you know, this morning, there's a tremendous amount of time uh, that the media is devoting to. Why are Trump and Melania holding hands now? Why aren't they holding hands then? Uh, look, they didn't hold hands going up the staircase to the airplane. By the way, it's not easy to hold hands walking up the staircase to the airlines. But anyway, the, it, it, you can't believe how petty, how um, how focused, how crazy these people are. But at the base of it is they're worried about the deplorables. Not only the deplorables here, the deplorables in Europe, deplorables in other countries besides uh, in besides Europe. This is a worldwide movement of, of, we can call it populism, right-wing populism, and that's what terrifies them. They want to suppress it. They want to, they want to kill it. They're afraid they're not going to be able to. All right. I've got a bunch of other things I want to talk about. We'll do that after we thank our sponsor. Folks, here's a novel approach. You don't like the price of a product and you think you can do a better job? Buy your own factory and start making it yourself. That's what Jeff and Andy did. 
They were just two regular guys, and they were fed up with buying overpriced razors. So they bought their own German factory that had over 100 years of blade-making experience to make sure they would get the highest quality blade. Harry's offers their blades at half the price of the leading five-blade razor. They sell directly to you over the Internet, and you're going to love the experience. The product itself is excellent. I've had lots of problems with blades in the past, but I get a beautiful, smooth shave with Harry's. It's a great system overall, which is why when I was looking for a Christmas gift for my old friend Michael Malice, I got him a beautiful Harry's shave set. Well, you can claim your free trial offer from Harry's. It's a $13 value for free when you sign up. Just cover three smackers for shipping, and you get a weighted ergonomic razor handle, five precision-engineered blades with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, a rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover. So to grab that, just head over to harrys.com slash woods. That's harrys.com slash woods. Lou, uh, before we go uh, any further, I want to say a word about an event coming up in October of this year, 2017. It's the 35th anniversary event of the Mises Institute. I distinctly recall the 25th anniversary event, which was also held in New York City, and how wonderful that was. And here we are at 35 years, and there's a a very, very compelling theme for this year's event. So can you take just a minute and tell us about it? And I will link today's show notes page is tomwoods.com slash 946. I'll link to the event page for anybody who would like to attend, which should be everyone listening, by the way. Well, one of the reasons you should be there is Tom Woods is going to be speaking, folks. Oh, well, naturally. So. That goes without saying. But but who, <laughs> but who? there are a couple of others uh, I know uh, are, you know, hard to, you know, are unusual uh, to, to, to be able to see in the U.S. No, so this is going to take place on uh, October 6th and 7th in New York City. Uh, go to the Mises.org, go to the link on, on uh, Tom's site uh, to see all about it. It's, we're going to have tremendous fun, uh, be with great friends, great to get a chance to hear some very great people. As I mentioned, Tom is speaking, Hans Hoppe is speaking, which is unusual for Hans to, uh, to come to this country. Uh, but he's coming to speak, as many others are coming to speak, because of the theme of the conference, which is the life and work of Murray Rothbard. Uh, this great man is still to this day constantly under attack by all the uh, people funded by the Kochs and Soroses and you know similar kinds of people. Uh, they fear him. And there's a reason they fear him and there's a reason they should fear him. Um, I think he's – I would say he's the best read – he may be the best read economist in the world. Uh, he's certainly better read than Keynes. He's certainly better read than Marx. Is Krugman or whatever better read? You know, I, uh, to pick a favorite of yours, Tom, I, I don't know. But uh, I remember when I made this point once before in writing, some uh, uh, friends and relatives of Milton Friedman got very, very upset at me and were denouncing the very idea. Uh, and my favorite reaction was a commenter on somebody's blog. And he said, look, this is an unfair comparison. The Mises Institute has put all of Rothbard's works for free on the web Milton Friedman's books are only in print, and they're very expensive. So it's you can't compare the two of them. Yeah, <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> give me more unfairness like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to be celebrating Murray, not only uh, with uh, talks by uh, Hans Hoppe, by Tom Woods, by Judge Napolitano, uh, by uh, Guido Holzman, who'll be coming from France, many other speakers, Paul Gottfried, who's uh, uh, of course a frequent guest of Tom's too. Uh, take a look at the site. You'll see some great names there. Uh, we're going to have fun. The, the policy of the Mises Institute is to try to do good and have fun doing it. So this is a perfect example of that. We're going to have great meals. We're going to be with great friends. We're not guided by any political correctness. It's just going to be tremendous. One of the things is a tour of uh, Mises's and, and uh, Murray's Manhattan with some extremely funny tour guides who know everything about and we're going to have a, also a panel telling stories about Murray. Uh, we're going to have uh, some of the young Rothbardians talk. Uh, we're going to just emphasize what an important man this was. Also, what just a great guy he was. I mean, he was the greatest guy you can imagine, as Tom knows, if you're going to have a beer with him. You just sit down and talk over a cup of coffee. There's nobody in the world you would want to do it more with than Murray Rothbard. Uh, he was not arrogant, unlike uh, a lot of top economists, a very sweet guy, a humble guy, unbelievably brilliant, a creative genius, one of the great 
a genius of the 20th century, I would argue, just an amazing man. So we want to try to give him some credit. We want to extend the knowledge of him and uh, have a lot of fun doing it. We're even going to have a a late night, uh, Murray was a famous night owl, so we're going to have a late night Rothbard nightclub uh, after the main dinner. And so just it's going to be tremendous fun. Uh, New York is was the city of Murray, also the city of Mises in, in this country. And uh, we're just, we're going to do good. We're going to have fun. We're going to spread the word. We're going to have students there with us, uh, as well as Mises Institute donors and supporters. And I, uh, I urge everybody, look into this. Think about coming. If you do come to join us, I'd love to shake your hand and meet you uh, if I don't already know you and even if, <laughs> if I do know you. But I can promise you, you will have a great time. The closest I came to seeing Murray on his home turf, so to speak, was uh, I saw – I know what building he lived in in Manhattan. Yes. And and it and it so happens that it's right across the street from I don't know if it's still there, but it was a restaurant that used to have all you can eat ribs and then back in the day when I used to do this sort of thing, all you can drink rolling rock. And some <laughs> grad students and I used to go there and I used to think uh you know, much, much more interesting than this particular restaurant is that building there across the street. So, yeah, I can't wait. I'll be there for every bit of it. I want to I'm going to see if I can somehow finagle my way onto that bus, too, because I would really love to see <laughs> what that's all about, especially with, as you say, the particular tour guides you guys have chosen. It's Walter Block. Like and, you know, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's going to be it's, a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely hysterical. And I let's say another just quick quick thing about a, another event, but this one goes on every single year, and it's coming up in a couple of weeks, and that's the Mises University program, where I first really learned Austrian economics back in 1993, if you can believe that. And I'm, I bring this up because Joe has uh, asked me to kick off the event this year with a Rothbard theme, given that that's also the theme of the event we just talked about. And so he's asking me to talk about what I learned from Rothbard, whom I did get to meet uh, several times. But, but of course, beyond that, in general, from studying his work and from observing his life, what, what can we walk away from, from that with? So that's going to be, I'm really going to enjoy putting that together, actually. Tom, I'll never forget the first time, at least to my knowledge, that you met Murray was at the Mises, at the Mises University. Yeah. And uh, I believe I introduced you to him. But anyway, he, he, I had already told him about, about you. He knew about you. He wanted to meet you. And so uh, you two were talking, uh, standing together, talking animatedly. And uh, so I walked away. And I, it seems to me it was a couple hours later I come back. And you're still there just talking, 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 both of you enjoying it so much. And uh, it was very moving and thrilling, especially in retrospect. Um, it, was a, it was a great moment. And the fact that uh, Murray had an influence on you as he did uh, so many of us and continues to have it through his, his writings, it's just tremendous. He's, he's, uh, he's one of the hopes for the future, for the future of freedom and for the future of Austrian economics. And he's already contributed so much uh, for so many people, so many books. Uh, and if you've not read Rothbard, by the way, just let me mention – He's an, outs, an, an unbelievable writer. If, if you're under the impression that economists write like uh, John Maynard Keynes, uh, who was actually a pretty good writer except in the general theory, uh, but if you, if you think of them as being difficult to understand and uh, writings full of uh, uh, irrelevant formulas and, and uh, reading like some bad sociologist, Rothbard is so clear, so interesting, so comprehensible – whether he's writing about American history or he's writing about uh, economic history or he's writing about um, libertarianism, wh- whatever is the topic. There are many of his works. I think of his work on the, his, his, his monograph on the state. Um, when you read Rothbard, you are never the same again. Now, some people read Rothbard and hate his guts, leftists. Uh, but people who are open, uh, who have inquiring minds, something that's not much encouraged these days in academia or any level of education. But those people who do, they read Rothbard, they're never the same. doesn't mean you agree with them on everything, uh, but you find him so compelling, so interesting, so logical, um, so fun, funny. Um, I I don't know of anybody like him uh, in the history of economics and in many other academic subjects too. Uh, So, you know, come in October, join us. Help honor him, help spread his message, 
Uh, it's essential, as Ron Paul points out, uh, for the future of freedom and uh, uh, for the future of prosperity, if we are to have any prosperity. Ron Paul, by the way, a close friend of Murray's, a colleague of Murray's, uh, he'll, of course, be there to speak to. We're going to have a great time. I'm going to make sure also at tomwoods.com slash 946 that I add your piece, Read Rothbard, where it's kind of a guide to his writings and you can get a sense of what's more academic, what's more popular, maybe the order you should start in, because it is a little bit intimidating when you look at his corpus. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to add that. And I remember uh, before we get back to the other stuff, I remember um, thinking to myself, here is potentially now I, you know, couldn't have known I was going to meet him later on uh, other times. But I thought this is potentially the only time I'll ever be able to talk to this guy. And I'm you know, I got to get everything out of it that I can. So I did, I did pick his brain quite a bit because I'd been doing a lot of reading. And I said, I know that uh, it's your opinion that the Eisenhower forces stole the nomination from Taft in 52. And I want to know where I can read about this. And so he said, oh, you'll read a book called The 20 Year Revolution by Chesley Manley. So, oh, okay. All right. I'll write that down. So of course I go back to college and you know, at their library, nobody has taken out Chesley Manley, the 20 year revolution. It's sitting there collecting dust. In fact, I don't think anybody had literally, I don't think anybody had ever taken that book out written in the fifties. So that, by the way, that's the beautiful thing about being a dissenter on a college campus. Uh, all the books are available. <laughs> you know, there's a, everything's sitting there on the shelf and there's no competition for them. And I just remember thinking in a million years, I would never have known to look at this book or find it or have heard of it. And here it is. I mean, it was just crazy. It was crazy. All right. Well, I'm gonna. Well, I'll save these stories for the, for that event. Anyway, let's get back to the the Trump thing. He's in Poland as we speak. And um, what's he been saying there? Well, so far as the now, I've I've not read everything he said. Of course, I'm sure they're not transcripts of it. Um, I, I'd like to think that maybe he's congratulating Poland on uh, not accepting all these welfare migrants. Uh, who are uh, all anti-Catholic and and uh, would like to destroy the traditional culture of Poland, among other questions. And they have no have had no terrorist incidents in Poland because they've accepted n- none. Um, out, of course, outraging uh, the EU bureaucrats. No, I don't think he's talking about that any more than he talks about such things here at home. Uh, but he apparently has said that uh, he apparently has condemned Russia for its uh, so-called aggression in uh, Ukraine and in Syria. Um, of course, the, for the idea that the U.S. is condemning anybody uh, for their aggression is, is uh, I guess, there's no sense of irony anymore. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very disappointing. Uh, he's got a meeting coming up with Putin. Uh, I would like to have thought that um, maybe something could be said in, a, in, a, in accord with what he said in his campaign, that he, he said, why can't we, what is wrong with being friendly with other countries? Well, as we know, uh, whether it's CNN or the CIA or, or Obama or the New York Times or John McCain or everybody evil in the country uh, who apparently want a war with Russia, which could, of course, bring about the end of the human race, among other uh, unfortunate uh, side effects. So it's it's uh, I'm disappointed to see. But maybe he doesn't mean this any more than he's meant some other things. Who who knows? But it's a uh, it's a very unfortunate thing. On the other hand. The Poles are not exactly pro-Russian, and who can blame them? They were, of course, occupied by the Tsars, by Tsarist Russia, and they were occupied much more uh, horrendously by communist Russia. And um, still, uh, stoking war fever is not a good thing, and we see that going on in the other end of the world and with, with the North Koreans. Uh, the U.S. has been at war, of course, technically with North Korea since the early 50s. Um, the U.S. occupies South Korea. It wants to keep trouble going because it justifies the occupation and the control of South Korea and justifies the occupation and the uh, its control of Japan. But, uh, you know, is is uh, the dictator of North Korea as crazy as the uh, CIA portrays him to be? Maybe, you know, he may very well be. Although it seems to me basically what they want is they want not to be attacked, which is where all this crazy missile stuff and so forth comes from. Um, and as usual, the U.S. Is, is putting out lies. For example, they said just recently, North Korea sent out an ICBM and it can easily strike the moon or Saturn or uh, Manhattan or whatever. Well, this is not – it went 600 miles. The definition 
U.S. government's definition of an ICBM is it has to go through, be able to go through 3,450 miles, 5,500 kilometers. Um, this one thing, this, this, um, um, uh, more, the more, the more most recent Scud missile, that's what this is, uh, went 600 miles. That's unfortunate. Nobody should be shooting off these things as the U.S., of course, shoots them off all the time. And we're supposed to applaud that and be thrilled by it. So to be ginning up uh, war fever rather than, you know, what, what Trump said was going to be his foreign policy. He even said at one point he'd like to sit down with uh, Kim Jong-il and try to see if things couldn't be worked out. I mean, maybe the U.S. could offer stopping its anti-civilian sanctions, which have been on for uh, such a very long time. Um, maybe the U.S. should stop blocking friendlier relations between North and South Korea, family uh, family uh, visits and that sort of thing. But in order to keep the war fever high, the, the Pentagon and CIA and all the, the various uh, institutions that make money off war and uh, the run-up to war, of course, are very opposed to that. I mean, it seems to me sometimes when one can think that Trump is being belligerent towards China and Russia and North Korea all at the same time. Seems to me that's not smart. It's not smart. It's not, uh, I mean, who is he catering to? The neocons love it. CIA loves it. Republican Party loves it. Democratic Party loves it. Uh, but the deplorables don't like it. Uh, one of the, 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 all the studies after the election show that one of the key things for the deplorables was Trump not wanting to be a warmonger. So I, I, uh, I'm not giving up on him. Good things can happen. He's, despite his unfortunate actions in Syria and Yemen, uh, there's unfortunate stuff going on in Somalia too. No American, of course, cares about that the U.S. is killing people in Somalia. That's just everyday thing. I mean, that's just what the government should be doing. Um, Trump said in, in Poland that the West will never be broken. Well, I don't know, is Irving Crystal's ghost writing this stuff for him? What that means is the empire will never be broken. Well, the Romans thought that, the British thought that, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Egyptians, many people have thought that their empire was never going to be broken. Uh, no empire is unbreakable. Every empire, because of all the various economic effects that it starts, the vast spending, the vast debt, the vast... Uh, surveillance of the of the its own people. Of course, it fears the most. You want to know who the U.S. government fears the most? It's not ISIS. It's the American people because ISIS can't actually do anything to them. We can do something to them if we ever wake up and want to do it. The Trump election, whatever's wrong with Trump, his election was a very good step forward. We just have to hope that, uh, and maybe there's going to be somebody better than Trump. Maybe there'll be somebody who actually means what Trump said uh, the next time. Because I think the Democrats are not going to be able to bring back Hillary or, uh, I don't know, Chuck Schumer or whoever, whoever they might think uh, they're going to bring back. So this is a scary time. It's an interesting time. Uh, it's a time for putting forward what Murray Rothbard always said was the key libertarian issue, that is war or peace. War is what gives the government the most power, the most control, the most sway over the minds and the hearts of its own people. And uh, those are just, and of course, a lot of people are killed, uh, tremendous destruction of property, families destroyed. U.S. has probably killed, since George W. Bush started his, his wars, uh, a million people. So we're supposed to think Saddam Hussein was a bad guy. How about that? A million people. Um, their families destroyed, homes destroyed. I, I, it's, it's, it's amazing what governments think they could do. I remember when George W. Bush... Uh, first started his war in Iraq, and his first action was to bomb a restaurant in downtown Baghdad because they had some of that great U.S. intelligence that uh, Saddam Hussein and his sons were dining there. Well, of course, they were not dining there, typical U.S. intelligence. So but he dropped a gigantic bomb in this restaurant. He killed the customers. He killed the owner. He killed the chef. He killed the waiters, killed people in the surrounding area. Nobody said, wait a minute. Why isn't that murder? Didn't he just commit an act of murder? And of course, he did commit an act of murder, but we're supposed to believe, as Murray always said, that the government is, is, is above the law, that the government is above the moral law, that the moral law doesn't apply to the government, that whatever, if it's killing people, why, that's war, it's not murder. If it's drafting people, that's not kidnapping. And uh, if it's uh, stealing people's money, that's taxation, that's not theft. So uh, Rothbard showed us the way. And uh, we need him now more than ever. 
So uh, read him, and it helps you interpret exactly what is going on, what the U.S. government is doing, the U.S. empire, what its satraps and vassals are doing, uh, what its opponents are doing. It's, uh, I'll just mention one last thing about North Korea. Communist countries tend not to be belligerent. The reason is not because they're good guys. I mean, the government of, uh, of the Soviet Union was probably the worst thing ever to exist in the history of the human race in terms of governments. Uh, these are very, very nasty operations. But they're also very poor operations. They're always economic basket cases. North Korea is an economic basket case. They couldn't actually sustain a war. They don't want a war. They're just very stupidly and irrationally sending off these missiles in an attempt to keep from being attacked. Uh, so why not negotiate? Why not offer a lifting of sanctions? Why not uh, not oppose trade with South Korea? Many things that could be done that would be uh, in the interest of the poor people of North Korea. Nobody cares about them. Uh, we should never forget that the first Korean War was started by the U.S. It was not started by North Korea. Uh, millions of civilians in North Korea were killed by the U.S. in the Korean War. Does anybody know that in this country? If, if people even remember there was a Korean War, they know nothing about the deliberate uh, bombings of dikes in North Korea to flood villages, all the deliberate killing of civilians. This, of course, is the U.S. way of war, despite their baloney about collateral damage. They actually seek collateral damage. That's – and in fact, in every modern war, the uh, casualties and the dead are always civilians. It's far more dangerous to be a civilian than to be a soldier. Uh, they, they go after the civilians. Uh, and this is, of course, against – uh, just war th doctrine. I, I have my own problems with just war doctrine. Uh, but um, one of the things it says, and Mises uh, upheld this too, he said, war, if you're going to have a war, it should be a war of the soldiers in the 18th century phrase, not against civilians. And uh, th th there had been tremendous progress made in that direction over the centuries. Uh, and then unfortunately along came Mr. Lincoln uh, and took us many steps backwards and really presaged everything that's happened in terms of the wars, the democratic wars of, uh, of uh, subsequent times. So we need to know about war. We need to watch what's going on. We need to educate ourselves. As you mentioned that article, Tom, people should read Rothbard. It is the most, he is the, the most fun, most interesting. Um, and again, you, you'll never be the same in a very, very good way. Lou, did you see that Speaking of North Korea, that the New York Times had to issue a correction it's because their reporter reported something from a parody North Korea account <laughs> as if it were fact coming from the North Korean regime. Well, the KCIA, which is the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, has a huge division, and they're no different from other countries, uh, making up stuff about North Korea. And uh, my favorite example was maybe this is two years ago. But it was all over the American news and, of course, South Korean news that uh, Kim Jong-il was requiring every young guy in North Korea to cut his hair exactly as Kim Jong-il did. He's a very odd-looking haircut. Well, this was, you know, you only have to think dictators don't do this kind of thing because it undermines them. Not because maybe they wouldn't like to, but they're very always very concerned about keeping on top and about what might affect, as, as all governments are, they don't trust the people that don't like the people. And the idea that even a crazy dictator would force everybody to cut his hair in a strange way would just cause all kinds of trouble he doesn't need. And, of course, it wasn't true. He didn't order everybody to get their hair cut in, a, in a, that uh, what well, looks to us. Maybe it doesn't look weird in North Korea, but it looks to us uh, as a very weird hairdo. So, really, you have to take everything we hear about countries that are being demonized leaders who were being demonized, all the stuff they said about Saddam Hussein, a lot of it wasn't true. All the stuff they said about Noriega and Panama, a lot of that wasn't true. You know, they, they always, the U.S. style, this was the British style too, the Romans did it. You always first demonize the other side, and then, of course, it's okay to kill them all. So it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's we just have, we have to be careful. For, for example, I'll just mention one thing. There's a, a free growing and use of marijuana in North Korea. Now, that's not the be-and-all and end-all of issues, but 
It seems to me it tells us there might be some things we don't know about this country. We know nothing about this country. Why do some people want to destroy that country and kill millions of people in the process? There's something wrong with that. It goes against the teachings of Jesus Christ. It goes against rationality. It goes against the interest of human flourishing. It goes against everything good. And yet uh, we're supposed to think perfectly okay to just kill them all. The thing about this, the particular error I had in mind is that if you actually go to this parody Twitter account, which is DPRK underscore news, Mm -hmm. it is so obviously a parody (laughs) account. Every single tweet is a joke. And the New York Times reported it like it was an actual tweet and then had to take it. I mean, it. This and this is all happening at the same time. But isn't, York, isn't the New York Times itself sort of a parody site? Yeah, that's yeah. Of course, indeed it is. Indeed it is. But I, I'm so glad that all these glaring errors are are coming out, uh, you know, all at the same time. But l- let me say just a, just a quick thing on this this whole Russia thing. That was the best thing about Trump was his 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 favoring de escalation with Russia and de escalation in general. That was the the reason that I thought, well, because I thought to myself, the only way this foreign policy, which the whole establishment has a a vested interest in maintaining, is ever going to be changed, is if you have some independent, headstrong person who gets in there and just says, over my dead body, and these things are going to change. And I thought, maybe this guy is that guy. I mean, I don't know. Uh, now, at the time, and I've got plenty of <laughs> plenty of examples of me in comment sections around the Internet saying my concern about the guy is that he's such an unsystematic thinker that you may just get a bunch of ad hoc policies instead of a consistent de-escalation, which, is, of course, is exactly what we have gotten. And so what I've said for a while is what Trump needs, if he really wants to do the things he said he wanted to do, I'll tell you what he needs. He needs Pat Buchanan. He needs Pat to write a couple of epic speeches for him, <laughs> and, 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 and he needs Pat to, to, to be a strategist, who would be much better than Steve Bannon, by the way. Pat would be the strategist he needs. He should bring Pat into the White House right now if he really wants something other than the, you know, the visceral enjoyment of some tweets. If he wants some successes, there's nobody who's been around the block more who's more in Trump's corner than Pat. It's absolutely true, Tom. It's a brilliant suggestion and makes me remember, of course, Pat worked for Richard Nixon and there was much wrong with Nixon. I didn't like him at the time and I certainly don't like him subsequently. Mm. But I'll always give him credit for bringing about detente with Russia and detente with China. Uh, I think that's why, by the way, he was taken down by the CIA and the FBI in, in the Watergate business because he wanted peace with, with the traditional enemies. Um, so that must be something in Trump's mind. Pat could, could advise him on what happened to Nixon, too. Uh, but if you're, uh, you know, did, did Trump actually intend what he said and then was, um, uh, uh, had a ho- woke up with a horse's head in his bed the next morning, as Bionic Mosquito put it? Uh, you know, who knows? But it doesn't, ju- whatever, whatever pressure is put on him, it doesn't justify his doing evil. And so if he, if he talking about all this war stuff is uh, sending in the ships and the planes and, and so forth, that's dangerous, but it's not irremediable. Uh, but to actually what, what he did in Syria, what he's doing in Yemen, what he's doing in Somalia, admittedly on a, a small scale, just uh, maybe a few thousand dead. So who cares about them except God and their families? Uh, but uh, – uh, if if he actually proceeds to do anything serious with North Korea, let alone Russia or China, um, there's no justification for it. I don't care what he's been threatened with. I don't. We have to hope, we have to pray that he does the right thing, that he has the courage of his former convictions and uh, tries to bring a little bit of peace to the world. Um, we, we just have to hope. We have to encourage him. We have to criticize him when he's doing the wrong thing. We have to praise him when he's doing the right thing. And uh, one thing I want to say, Mr. Trump, keep up the tweets about CNN. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Plus, plus I, in general, for any president, the more they tweet, the better. The more they're occupied with that stuff, the better, <laughs> especially if it's going to entertain me, which is the apparently all I'm ever going to get. But anyway, Lou, I guess I'll be seeing you uh, – Let's see. As we're recording this, what what is it? The sixth of uh, July? Yeah. So, I guess I'll I'll be down there in just over two weeks for the Mises University program, and I'm really thrilled. Every year, it's my favorite week of the year. I'm really glad to 
be a part of it. And, and as I told you, Bob Murphy and I coined uh, an expression, uh, post-Mises U depression. It's the <laughs> official term for how you feel on Saturday afternoon at the barbecue <laughs> when it's all wrapping up and you know you have a whole year to go for the next Mises U. So looking forward to that, and thanks a lot. Tom, thanks for starring on that, and thanks for all you do. All right, everybody, do not touch that dial, because before we wrap up for today, I got a website that's going to be of interest to a good many of you listening here. It was, of course, created by a listener of this show, and it's called anarchochristian.com, and it evaluates the relationship between the Christian and the state. And so you'll see a great many posts there. Well, over the as, as time goes on, you'll see more and more. But there is a whole bunch raising questions that are of interest to Christians about whether it's the death penalty or war or obedience or all kinds of other topics that are going to come up in this kind of context. So anarchochristian.com is going to help you think about these sorts of things, it engages with a lot of very important topics, and... It's a useful site for a position that is not all that well known. I mean, we know about the religious right, we know about the religious left, but anarchochristian.com blows that all to bits and gives you a whole new perspective on these issues. So check that out. I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 946, as the listener website mentioned. And remember, I got a pretty sizable audience, so if I mention a website, it gets traffic. And if you'd like to start a website and not have tumbleweed rolling by when you announce it, then get your web hosting through my link and I will give you publicity along with several other very, very valuable bonuses absolutely for free. So check out the details on how to do that at tomwoods.com slash publicity. And by the way, I recently, as in just yesterday, I re-recorded the video taking you step by step through how to basically start up your blog in five minutes. Because my old video from a couple years ago was a little bit out of date because some of the screens that you see now are different from how they used to look. So I decided to just make the video all over again. So there's a brand new video up there uh, taking you step by step. You can do this. It's easy. That's why I made the video to show you how easy it is. You can be blogging five minutes from now. So check it out at TomWoods.com slash publicity, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. that you could have said almost all those things apart from apart from his buffoonery you could have said all those things about any president and then some so i'm not buying that that's the real reason they're upset at him what's interesting about all this is that really when you look at his foreign policy and as you told me before we went on when you look at what he's saying in poland and maybe you could tell us what he's saying in poland he really is just doubling down on the bipartisan foreign policy so these people are paranoid they're crazy paranoid he's not really giving you uh, you know a pat buchanan foreign policy so what are they all so hysterical about well, I think what, they're, what they fear, what they are hysterical about is the people who support Trump. The idea that that many Americans, despite all the attempts to prevent this from happening, voted for somebody who they thought was happy to overthrow the entire system, who wanted, at least if you could believe him during the campaign, a foreign policy of peace, who wanted to be friends with other countries uh, and wanted a, a sea change and didn't like the deep state and didn't like the whole apparatus in Washington, didn't like the Republicans any more than he liked the Democrats, and wanted the fact, I think it terrifies them to every moment of their lives now, that that many Americans agree with the Trump they saw during the campaign. That is why they're, that's, that's why they flip out. So, uh, it somehow, it, so it doesn't matter if Trump's doing stuff they like, if it were anybody else uh, besides Trump doing it, they can't stand the thought of, is this the beginning of a revolution? Is this, is this not the end of these sorts of ideas? But regardless of what Trump does or doesn't do, is this the beginning of a very significant uh, change in American foreign policy? And maybe uh, uh, other policies of government, maybe in the entire uh, Western world's foreign policies, could be. So we can hope and pray that's the case. But they're terrified of it. And that's, again, why they flip out while they're constantly on a hair trigger alert. Uh, and of course, these shows, I myself have a very hard time watching, say, Morning Germ 
as I think of that show. Um, but every show, so far as I can tell, is nothing about it's a hate Trump. Uh, and, you know, this morning there's a tremendous amount of time uh, that the media is devoting to. Why are Trump and Melania holding hands now? Why aren't they holding hands then? Uh, look, they didn't hold hands going up the staircase to the airplane. By the way, it's not easy to hold hands walking up the staircase to the airlines. But anyway, the, it, it, you can't believe how petty, how um, how focused, how crazy these people are. But at the base of it is they're worried about the deplorables. Not only the deplorables here, the deplorables in Europe, deplorables in other countries besides uh, in besides Europe. This is a worldwide movement of, of, we can call it populism, right-wing populism, and that's what terrifies them. They want to suppress it. They want to, they want to kill it. They're afraid they're not going to be able to. All right. I've got a bunch of other things I want to talk about. We'll do that after we thank our sponsor. Folks, here's a novel approach. You don't like the price of a product and you think you can do a better job? Buy your own factory and start making it yourself. That's what Jeff and Andy did. They were just two regular guys, and they were fed up with buying overpriced razors. So they bought their own German factory that had over 100 years of blade-making experience to make sure they would get the highest quality blade. Harry's offers their blades at half the price of the leading five-blade razor. They sell directly to you over the Internet, and you're going to love the experience. The product itself is excellent. I've had lots of problems with blades in the past, but I get a beautiful, smooth shave with Harry's. It's a great system overall, which is why when I was looking for a Christmas gift for my old friend Michael Malice, I got him a beautiful Harry's shave set. Well, you can claim your free trial offer from Harry's. It's a $13 value for free when you sign up. Just cover three smackers for shipping, and you get a weighted ergonomic razor handle, five precision-engineered blades with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, a rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover. So to grab that, just head over to harrys.com slash woods. That's harrys.com slash woods. Lou, uh, before we go uh, any further, I want to say a word about an event coming up in October of this year, 2017. It's the 35th anniversary event of the Mises Institute. I distinctly recall the 25th anniversary event, which was also held in New York City, and how wonderful that was. And here we are at 35 years, and there's a, a very, very compelling theme for this year's event. So can you take just a minute and tell us about it? And I will link today's show notes page is tomwoods.com slash 946. I'll link to the event page for anybody who would like to attend, which should be everyone listening, by the way. Well, one of the reasons you should be there is Tom Woods is going to be speaking, folks. Oh well, naturally so. that goes without saying. But but who? <laughs> but but there are a couple of others uh, I know uh, are you know hard to you know are unusual uh, to 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 be able to see in the U.S. No, so this is going to take place on uh, October sixth and seventh in New York City. Uh, go to the Mises.org. Go to the link on on uh, Tom's site uh, to see all about it. It's, we're going to have tremendous fun. Uh, be with great friends. Great to get a chance to hear some very great people. As I mentioned, Tom is speaking. Hans Hoppe is speaking, which is unusual for Hans to uh, to come to this country. Uh, but he's coming to speak, as many others are coming to speak, because of the theme of the conference, which is the life and work of Murray Rothbard. Uh, this great man is still to this day constantly under attack by all the uh, people funded by the Kochs and Soroses and you know similar kinds of people. Uh, they fear him. And there's a reason they fear him and there's a reason they should fear him. Um, I think he's, I, I would say he's the best read, he may be the best read economist in the world. Uh, he's certainly better read than Keynes. He's certainly better read than Marx. Is Krugman or whatever better read? You know, I, uh, to pick a favorite of yours, Tom, I, I don't know. But uh, I remember when I made this point once before in writing, some uh, uh, friends and relatives of Milton Friedman got very, very upset at me. And we're denouncing the very idea. Uh, and my favorite reaction was a commenter on somebody's blog. And he said, look, this is an unfair comparison. The Mises Institute has put all of Rothbard's works for free on the web. Milton Friedman's books are only in print and they're very expensive. So it's, you can't compare the two of them. Yeah. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> Give me more unfairness like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to be celebrating Murray. Not only uh, with uh, talks by uh, Hans Hoppe, by Tom Woods, by Judge Napolitano, 
by uh, Guido Holzman, who'll be coming from France. Many other speakers, Paul Gottfried, who's, uh, uh, of course, a frequent guest of Tom's, too. Uh, take a look at the site. You'll see some great names there. Uh, we're going to have fun. The, the policy of the Mises Institute is to try to do good and have fun doing it. So this is a perfect example of that. We're going to have talks like Trump and, and – uh, I'm not for shutting that down. They they have the right to do what they want. But I, I'm, I, I'm aware that if uh, this had happened under the Obama administration with Obama as playing Caesar, CNN would have been the first to call for everybody being arrested and jailed. So um, I don't want to shock anybody. They turned out to be hypocrites, but very thin-skinned hypocrites. And I think for good reason, because who believes them, who trusts them, who likes them? You have the, You have their very strong fans who are – uh, among the left, uh, but regular Americans, as well as, of course, right-wing Americans, despise CNN but never look at it. So that's my own position, and and uh, uh, they're aware of it. So they're aware that they're in a precarious position, uh, but they just have to keep going. They have to keep making more openings for Trump and uh, all the critics of CNN and, the and of course, MSNBC and uh, even Fox – is not too hot, and uh, all the broadcast networks are terrible. Really, Tom, I've never seen anything like this in my life. This is this is a more intense attack on a public uh, figure than uh, even I think Joe McCarthy. I mean, it's quite, it's really quite astounding, but it's not working. I mean, because whenever Trump does something that bugs his base, which is uh, uh, unfortunately all too often, it only takes something like this. And I'm sure Trump knows exactly what he's doing to bring the base back to him uh, because they can't stand CNN. I, I feel the same way. They hate CNN and everything CNN stands for. So um, it's tremendous fun. We don't get much for our tax dollars, but the Trump tweeting is one of the things we do get. So it's fun. It's entertaining. And uh, it bugs all the right people. I, I, uh, I enjoy it. And I, I, th I think plenty of other people do, too. Um, I was just going to say one thing about professional wrestling. Uh, I, I'd gone to matches as a kid uh, in the last couple of years because of the wonderful libertarian wrestler Kane. I was able to uh, see some matches in uh, Columbus, Georgia. And I was amazed and thrilled to see who the audience was. It was virtually all dads and little boys, maybe the friends of their sons, multiple sons or whatever. And uh, they all loved it. And, uh, uh, of course, everybody knows this is make-believe violence, not actual violence. And I thought, it, you know, sort of uh, it uh, th thrills little boys and uh, in a way that's entirely harmless. It's quite a – you know, it's quite a – I had a new appreciation for it. Uh, it's quite a wonderful thing. So no wonder CNN doesn't get it. Uh, they, they don't get anything that's in the mainstream culture or the uh, – certainly the culture of the deplorables. They're entirely separate. And uh, I think and hope they're going down. I, I think that they're uh, going to be in even more financial and other other trouble than they than they are now. And there's a great rumor that AT and T, which may be buying Time Warner uh, and therefore would have control of CNN, is concerned. They want to they want to revise CNN. They want to revamp it. They don't like the way CNN is operating. So I hope that's true. And certainly they're worrying about that at CNN, uh, and they should worry. I love to have the Maury. Well, let's say a word about James O'Keefe and Project Veritas. Now, once this all dies down, I'm going to try and get him on. I discovered the other day that we're Facebook friends. I don't recall this, but I've been on Facebook for, I guess, at least 10 years. So that's possible that could have happened. But anyway, he's been releasing videos pretty regularly day after day. And they're undercover video or they're videos that are uh, recorded without the knowledge, obviously, of the people at CNN. And the one just yesterday, I mean, the first couple ones were, uh, you know, the Russia story is BS and a nothing burger and all that. And then the other day, he got somebody saying a bunch of things, including that none of us can stand Chris Cuomo, but <laughs> he happens to be the, gov the governor's brother and we're not. And you just and, and he's so dumb, every time he opens his mouth, we're all saying, just shut up. So... <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that is also glorious to see. Uh, and, and I'm reading, you know, we, you and I both read uh, Bob Wenzel, and he absolutely insists that O'Keefe has so much more to come, and I wish I knew what that meant. But 
uh, comment about Project Veritas. What an astounding thing that uh, O'Keefe has done. Um, I think we all owe him uh, a tremendous debt of gratitude for his showing up of Planned Parenthood uh, and showing just what monster these these people are. I mean, they're really ghouls. They're vampires. They're, they're of course, uh, communists and everything else evil. And he showed them up. The media, of course, kept saying, don't believe what these people are saying. It's all phony. Um, o- O'Keefe is a trickster. They're not actually saying these things. So it's uh, um, it really, if you want to know about the abortion industry in this country, O'Keefe exposed it as it never has been exposed before. And now look what he's doing to CNN. He did the same thing to various left-wing groups that were uh, on Obama's side uh, in, in previous elections, uh, showing that they were glad to enlist anybody as a voter, even if they knew that they were illegals. I don't think there's any question there was vast amount of, of uh, bringing illegals into voting booths by the Democratic Party and, and uh, George Soros's um, various foundations and, and uh, nonprofits. And so Keith, and, and now he's done this, it really is astounding to see these people speaking the truth. I mean, it's a tremendous, uh, just a tremendous thing. And uh, I know sometimes people imply this is illegal for him to do it. It's not illegal. Uh, Georgia, where this was taking place, is one of those states where only one person has to know that you're being recorded. And, of course, by the way, the government claims they can record you even though, you know, (laughs) they can record two people talking even if neither one of them agrees. Um, But anyway, in Georgia, you can record and he's just uh, O'Keefe is a star. He's he's uh, just extra- an extraordinary guy. I mean, a great entrepreneur, and uh, he's another Tom Woods, maybe. Uh, so this is huh. this is this is uh, just thrilling. Yeah, it, it is. And and on that matter of Planned Parenthood and abortion, you know, people tried to come back with, oh, it's not what it looks like, and all that. But <laughs> I, I distinctly recall there was one video where they've got these aborted baby sitting there on a table and one of them and one of the women in the room I mean normal people don't act like this Uh, one of the women in the room pointed at one and said oh this was a boy and they go oh but but not like oh isn't it a shame this is a dead boy in front of me like they're clearly they're not saying oh here here's an unidentifiable clump of tissue they they weren't saying that they were saying oh here and it was just ghoulish ghoulish is the word I, I think I even used that word at the time now the funny thing about all this Lou is that given their insane opposition to Trump and believe me there are a lot of things you know, I didn't like the Syria bombing there are plenty of things to say against Trump but given the Tom Woods Show, episode 946. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Men, get yourselves an affordable and top-notch shave using Harry's razors. Just cover three smackers for shipping, and you can claim your free trial offer from Harry's today. That's a $13 value for free when you sign up at harrys.com slash woods. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Lou Rockwell is finally back on the show. I am delighted to announce. And I thought we'd just talk about current events, what's going on with CNN, with the president in Poland and Russia, possibly North Korea, a whole bunch of fun stuff, and also Murray Rothbard thrown in. Lou, as most of you know, publishes LouRockwell.com, which is the indispensable libertarian website. He's the founder and chairman of the Mises Institute over at Mises.org. He was a um, chief of staff to Ron Paul and a tremendous benefactor of mine. Uh, He really, over the years, I really can't think of anybody who boosted me and my work more consistently than Lou, even at particularly dark moments. Uh, Lou was there as a friend, boosting and helping me to get the word out, and uh, you know that alone makes him a great guy, but good thing for him, he's got 873 other things that make him a great guy. So I'm always glad to have a chance to talk to him. Lou, welcome back to the show. Tom, great to be with you. A lot of stuff going on. I am interested in this whole unfolding CNN fiasco. So for (laughs) anybody who somehow hasn't been paying attention or something or had the good fortune to go on vacation, what happened is that the president tweeted out a video, which was drawn originally from a 
wrestling event from years ago, but somebody patched on the CNN logo onto the head of Trump's opponent. And you see Trump outside the ring of this event, who and he actually body slams the guy, but now the guy has a CNN head. And everybody, well, by everybody, I mean just people in the media, were up in arms because this is supposedly encouraging violence against the media. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and of course, don't you all remember growing up and knowing that professional wrestling was fake? Right, just like their news. Right? Why are they so worked up about this? What did you think about that whole thing? And then CNN's response. Well, first of all, of course, I loved it. And I I, uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. And I remember having, it was seen, funny. having seen that before. And it was, of course, a setup. Uh, nobody was actually body slammed. That was the head of the WWE uh, that Trump was having a phony feud with, as this happens in professional wrestling. And uh, so it's just... Just funny, and it was, I thought, especially funny that some, apparently a kid, sent this out on Reddit with the CNN logo instead of the guy's head, uh, and then Trump retweets it, or tweets it, uh, maybe not as a retweet, but he put it he put it out on his Twitter feed. And yeah, CNN absolutely flipped out, claiming that Trump was uh, calling for violence against them, although he, at most, he could be, I guess, charged with calling for phony violence against them, as you say, like they're fake news. But they they flipped out, and of course, these are the people who think it's charming and wonderful that that in a modern dress version of Julius Caesar, uh, they've dramatically extended the uh, assassination scene, and Trump and the uh, guy playing Caesar looks exactly like Trump, dresses like Trump. 